Thank you for being here tonight. If you give me a moment or two, I'll preach for just a little bit. From the book of Job, chapter number one. Job, chapter number one. I want to thank you for your faithfulness to be here this Sunday evening service. Thank you, youth choir. You did a wonderful job. It's always a blessing to hear the choirs around here. And uh, just to be around you folks is an encouragement to our hearts. Good to be at the Victory Baptist Church. Thank you, preacher, for inviting us to come. Job chapter 1, you are very familiar with. I'll read a little bit in this chapter. And I have a little thought on my mind tonight. From the beginning in Job chapter 1 and... We'll read verse 1 and then we'll jump down to verse 6. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. In verse number 6, the Bible said, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them. The Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While I was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men. And they are dead. And I only am alone, escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, Excuse me. From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a posture to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. 
But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now if we were to keep reading, we would find that Job's three friends come. And for several days they sit down around him. And they do not say a word. And then they start talking. And it would have been better if they had kept quiet. Yeah. Job will say to them, miserable comforters are ye all. <laughs> Ever had a miserable comforter? <laughs> Ever been one? I want you to notice another verse, chapter 38, verse 1. This will be our text verse. Chapter 38 and verse 1. In fact, not even the entire verse, just the first five words. Genesis 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job. Then the Lord answered Job. Have you ever noticed sometimes in life how hard it is to get an answer out of someone? I was uh, in uh, Georgia preaching. And uh, here's a question for you. We were under a tent. Maybe you can explain this to me. We were under a tent having a meeting right next to a $3.1 million auditorium. (coughs) That's a question I haven't figured out. And so during the day, we would take the instruments and put them in the church. And then in the, in the evening, I would get them and uh, get them out and tune them. So I walked into the auditorium one night. And I was going to get the instruments and tune them up. Now, I've had these instruments. My banjo, my, my mama gave me when my father went home to be with the Lord. My fiddle was given to me. Uh, my, my guitar, I've had for probably 40 years. And so it's almost more like a member of the family than it is just an instrument and a possession. So I'm careful with it. And I came in one night and and I was going to tune up and here was a little girl and had my guitar case open and was getting my guitar out of the case. Just a little girl. And I didn't want her to get it out of the case, but I didn't want to scare her. I I was trying to be careful. I didn't want to scare her and I didn't want to yell. Well, I did want to yell, but I shouldn't (laughs) yell. And so I said to her as softly as I could, I said, honey, that's not a good idea. And when she looked up and saw me, she slammed the top of the case down. Now, the guitar was flat in the case, so it didn't hurt it. And she looked at me. And she didn't say a word. So I looked at her and I said, what's your name? And she said, after she thought a moment, I don't remember my name. (laughs) I said, you don't remember your name? She said, isn't that funny? I can't remember my name. Well, you know why she didn't want to tell me her name. She didn't want to get in trouble. I wouldn't have told on her. I was just trying to make conversation. But it was hard to get an answer out of her. And a lot of time in life, it's hard to get an answer. Now, that's a comical illustration. But there's nothing funny about it when the doctor is giving you bad news. And you would like for the Lord to explain to you why. Or maybe you're looking in the face of a loved one in a coffin. And for the life of you, you can't figure out how this would be the right thing. And somehow you and I feel like if God would just give us an explanation, an answer, so that we could say, this is why this happened, we'd feel better about it. I know folks who've gone through great sorrow and Suffering, and they spend a good portion of the rest of their lives trying to answer this question. Why? We're always looking for an answer. Now, if you want to take Job's life and measure it by chapters, Job has spent 37 chapters looking for an answer. Wanting God to say, Job, this is why you're suffering. Job, this is what happened. But he doesn't get an answer. As a matter of fact, he'll say in one place, he'll he'll say, oh, that I knew where I might find him. I've been looking. 
He says in one place, I think I marked it in my Bible. He says, uh, he said, behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see. Job said, I've been looking everywhere. I've been looking frontward and backward on the right hand, on the left hand. Now that always interested me. He said on the left hand where he doth work. You know the left. I better be careful. This is a whole other message. But anyway, he said, I can't find him. I, I've looked in front. I've looked behind. The right, the left. I can't find him anywhere. Job is looking for an answer. Well, when we get finally to chapter 38, Job gets an answer. I'm interested in that answer tonight. I want to say three things about it. I want you to notice, first of all, the moment of the answer. It starts, the verse starts with the word then. Now, then is a time word. It puts us on a timeline. If you use the word then, it's like saying, well, we'll do this and then. Or this happened and then that happened. So we've got a timetable here. So exactly when did Job get this answer from God? When? What's the moment of it? The timing of it? He got it, first of all, after the extending of Satan's power in his life. We read about it in chapter 1. The, the devil came before the Lord. Satan came before the Lord. The Lord said, from whence comest thou? One writer I read said this. He said, the idea uh, behind this, when the Lord said, whence comest thou? And Satan said, from going to and from in the earth. He said the idea behind that is Satan is saying, I've been running up down the earth looking for somebody fit for a fight. And God said, you thought about Job? He's pretty fit. He's perfect, upright, as true as evil. And so the devil, he made this accusation against Job and more or less God said, okay, try him out. Let's find out. Now somebody will say to me tonight, and it has been said to me, somebody will say to me, I do not like the idea of God giving the devil, giving Satan permission to touch Job. I don't like it either. But here's what I do like. I do like the fact that Job had to get permission. You may not be happy that God gave it to him, but you ought to be happy that he had to get it from God. That he just couldn't put his hand on Job without God lowering the hedge. I'm glad for the hedge. I'm glad he watches out for me. I'm glad the angels of God are encamped round about me. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? So there's the extending of Satan's power. There is the exhausting of Job's resources. This comes after everything that is humanly possible that could help Job has failed him. His wife has failed him. I remember Brother Job, Arthur, preaching on Job's wife. And, and uh, I agree with what he said. Uh, but I thought about Job's wife. You know, it's hard for me to imagine that Job would marry a woman who didn't love God. He loved God. And Job even says to her, when she says, curse God and die, here is Job's response. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women. It's as though he said, this is not the way you normally talk. This is not the way you talk. You're a Christian woman. You're talking like a foolish woman. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The foolish women were ones who lived with no regard to God. He said, you're talking like them. What he was saying, I believe, was this is not the way you normally talk. But I would say this to you. You can come to a point in your life when you get broken. When you've had more than you feel like you can handle. When you've just come to the end. When you have, it, it, we use this term in this phraseology, you've come to the end of your rope. And I believe that's where Job's wife is. And you better be careful about how you judge her. Because you might end up there tomorrow. You know, I was reading, even as I was, even as I was reading here a moment ago in that, in that first chapter, it struck me, it struck me. And there came a messenger. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. Uh, just one, boom, boom, boom. Think about it. Many times in our life, uh, there's something comes up and then all of a sudden, there's another. And all of a sudden, there's another. Well, in Job's life, it just keeps going and going and going. I can't imagine what it must have been like for her. So she finally said, be better to die. She wasn't much help to Job. And then his friends came. And they weren't much help. I noticed this in my own life. When people suffer, I want to say something. I want to have something to say to them. 
And most of the time what I say would have been better left unsaid. Sometimes folk don't need to hear you say anything. They just need to know you will hear what they have to say. I had a fellow come to me when I was pastoring. And he was having difficulty. So he sat down in my living room. He sat over here and I sat over here. And he started talking. And he's talking and in the middle of his talking I would say, mm, 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 mm. And he talked a little longer and I'd say, my, oh, my, oh, my. And he talked a little longer and I'd say, isn't that something? And he talked a little longer and I'd say, mm, 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 mm. And he talked a little longer and I'd say, my, oh, my, oh, my. And he talked a little longer and I'd say, isn't that something? Three hours. Three hours he talked and I went, mm, 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 mm. My, oh, my, oh, my. Isn't that something? Finally, when those three hours were up, he looked at me and he said, Thank you, Pastor. You have helped me so much. Thank you for your advice. All I said was, mm, 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 mm. My, oh, my, oh, my. Isn't that something? He didn't need somebody to tell him anything. He just needed somebody who would hear him. David said in Psalm 130, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. David didn't say he answered. He said he heard me. God said uh, to uh, Moses when he was going to send him to Egypt. He said I have surely seen the affliction of my people. And I have heard their cry. These fellas, if they would have just hushed. And let Job talk. They would have been of much more help to him. But see they had a theory. All of them had the same theory. They approached it from different avenues. But all of them had the same theory. And here was their theory. Job, you don't suffer unless you have secret sin. Job, you're a hypocrite. Job, if you'd been living right, if you didn't have some sin in your life, if you weren't a hypocrite, you would not face what you're facing. That's what the, that was there. Every one of them, all three of them, that was their theory. That Job was a sinner. We're hard on those three fellas. But how many times have you looked at somebody who was suffering and the thought came to your mind they're reaping what they sold. You know one of these days it might be our turn. And we won't want somebody to look at us and think in their mind you're getting what you deserve. We'll want some mercy won't we? And some compassion. So we better be careful since the Bible said we reap what we sow. There's another fellow that comes. This answer comes after the exhortation of Elihu. Elihu shows up. Elihu has a different, he has a different theory than these other three. The other three, their theory, their basic uh, concept of this is, Job, you're a secret sinner and you're reaping what you sowed. But Elihu's theory is this. Elihu says to Job basically, not in these words, but this is the gist of his message. Elihu said, now Job, I don't think you have secret sin somewhere. I think this is a trial from God. It's not not about sin but he said Job you do have a problem and your problem is right now in the middle of it you don't have a good attitude it's not that you've got secret sin in your past it's that Job right now in the middle of your trial your attitude toward God is not what it ought to be and so Elihu gives him his sermon and then the Bible said there's an answer coming. So it comes, the moment of this answer is after all these things have gone on in Job's life for 37 chapters. That's a long time to wait for an answer. Then I want you to notice this second thing. I want you to notice the mystery of this answer. This is a mysterious answer. When the answer finally does come, it's not the answer you would think would be. It's not the answer, I don't, I don't think it's the answer Job was expecting. It is, first of all, not an answer of explanation. Now, Job wants to know why he's suffering. Don't you think that the easiest thing for God to do is to say to Job, Well, Job, I was sitting on my throne, and Satan came, the sons of God came, and Satan came with him. And I said, Whence comest thou? And he said, From going to and fro in the earth. And, uh, and uh, uh, I said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And, uh, and the Satan said to me, Doth Job serve God for naught? You put a hedge about him. And so I said, Okay, uh, you, can, you can touch him, only, only uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can go ahead and work in his life. And I gave Satan Lee. You, you see, there's an explanation. Wouldn't that be easy? Now let me ask you a question. Do you know who wrote the book of Job? You don't, do you? And I don't either. I don't know if Job wrote it. I don't know if somebody else wrote it after Job.
Job was gone. But if Job did not write the book of Job, and if it wasn't written until after he went to be with the Lord, then Job never knew what you and I know about this trial. He spent the rest of his life with no explanation. And you better mark it down, friend. It might just be that there will never be an explanation in this life as to why you went through or are going through what you're going through. There is no explanation in this answer. And then secondly, there is no, I like to put it this way, there is no expectation in this answer. God does not say, now Job, buck up boy, uh, uh, it's going to get better. Hang on Job, hang in there. Things are going to get better. You and I know that things do get better. You and I know what happens at the end of the book. But Job doesn't know that and God does promise him that things will get better they tell me when you talk about counseling they tell me it's important to, to find hope for the person you're counseling it's important to leave them with hope and so I'm always looking for hopeful things if I deal with people but God does not do that with Job God doesn't say okay Job gonna get better hang on no expectation no hope and then it's not an answer of exclamation what do you mean preacher Joke, God doesn't say, have you ever done this with somebody? They're hurting and you put your arm around them and you say, man, I, I feel your pain. I know how, I know how hard it is. I, it, it's bad. I know it. I hurt with you. God does not do that with Job. Now, God does do that in the Bible because the Bible said, the Hebrew writer said he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And the Bible said in Hebrews, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a faithful and a merciful high priest in Psalm 134. Did you ever notice Psalm 134? It, when those servants by night stand in the house of the Lord. And there are three verses, and every verse has the word bless in it. The first verse says, uh, uh, Behold, ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Bless the Lord. And then the second verse says, To bless the Lord. Lift up your hands in the, in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And that word bless means to bow down and adore. But bless is in the third verse, but it's different. It's the same word, but it's different. How is it different? In verse 1, it's bless the Lord. In verse 2, it's bless the Lord. But in verse 3, it's the Lord bless thee out of Zion. So my thought on that is, if we will bless the Lord, they're supposed to bless the Lord in verse 1. Bow down and tell Him how much they loved Him. Verse 2, bow down and tell Him how wonderful He is. And if they do that in verse 3, God will bow down and put His arm around them and say, I love you too. You ever had God just put His arms around you in the sweet Holy Ghost and remind you that you're His and that He loves you and He cares for you? Sure you yeah. have. But God does not do that with Job. So there's no explanation, there is no expectation, there is no exclamation. So what kind of answer is this? You think I forgot, but I haven't. I want you to see the mercy of this answer. Go back to Job 38. And let's look at God's answer to Job. Then the Lord answered Job. Now, now let me stop and say this. I've read some commentators who take these next verses and say that the Lord is speaking to the three friends in Elihu. But that is not what the Bible says. What does your Bible say? Then the Lord answered who? Job. Job. And if you go to chapter number 42, the Bible will say in verse 7, and it was so, chapter 42 and verse 7, and it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto who? Job. So God is not speaking to the three friends and he's not speaking to Elihu. He's speaking to Job. Let's listen to his answer. What he says to Job. Then the Lord, chapter 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Job, you're talking about things you don't know anything about. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. Job, I want an answer from you. And here's what I want an answer. You, you know, you read this and you think, boy, here's a man. He'd been, he'd been through all kinds of things. And God is just not being very kind and merciful here. Job, you've been demanding an answer of me. I want an answer from you. Let's listen to these questions. Verse 4, where was thou? 
Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understand. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth? As if it had issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof. And thick darkness a swaddling band for it. And break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors. Now God's answering his own question. He said, who made this? Who did this? He said, I did. I did. Then he goes on in verse number 12. He said, hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? In verse 16, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? In verse 18, hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? In verse 21, knowest thou it? In verse 22, hast thou? In verse 31, canst thou? In verse 32, canst thou? In verse 33, knowest thou? In verse 34, canst thou? In verse 35, canst thou? Chapter 39 and verse 1, knowest thou? Verse 2, canst thou? Verse 10, canst thou? thou? Verse 19, hast thou? Verse 20, canst thou? On and on we go. You keep reading it over and over till we get to chapter 42. Hast thou? Knowest thou? Wilt thou? Canst thou? Hast thou? Knowest thou? Wilt thou? Canst thou? Here's what God says to Job. Job, did you do this? No, you didn't. I did. Do you know this? No, you don't. I do. Did you say this? No, you don't. I said it. Job, can you do this? No. Did you make this? No, I made it. Here's God's answer. God said, Job, you don't need an explanation you need me. He is saying, Job, I am your answer. Amen. Amen. You don't need another answer. You just need me. Amen. I call it the mercy of the answer for this reason. Listen to me now. Everything that comes into my life that takes my attention off of myself and puts my focus upon God is good for me. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how much sorrow there is in it, if it focuses my attention on the God who owns me, it's good for me. I am your answer, Job. When I pastored a little church up in Michigan, every Thursday night in our midweek service, we sang, I guess probably every Thursday night, we sang number 67 out of the old red hymn book. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. God is saying to Job, Job, you don't need an explanation. You just need me. I am your answer. Amen. Amen. You know, have you ever noticed with children, they'll ask a question, and you give them the answer, and the answer brings up another question. Yeah. And you answer <coughs> that question, and that answer brings up another question, and if you let it go on, it'd still be going on tonight. Why is it that children, when you answer them, it brings up another question? Because your understanding is much greater than theirs. It's on another level than theirs. How much higher do you think God's understanding is than mine? Do you think, I don't think if God explained things to me, I could still, I could understand them. I think what it would do is if God explained it to me, I'd say, but what about? And he'd explain that, and I'd say, but what about? And he'd explain that, and I'd say, but what about? And so finally, he's going to say to me, will you just trust me? I'm trustworthy. I always do what's right. Will you just trust me? And the mercy of all of our sorrows and all of our trials and all of our suffering is when we look at God and say, Lord, I trust you. You always do what's right. And I don't need an explanation. I just need you. Amen. I trust you. Job did not know. Job was not meant to know. Job was meant to know God. 
Now you say, well, did Job, did the answer satisfy him? Here's what Job said. Chapter 43, 42, verse 5. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job says before that, Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. What's he saying? Job's saying, All right, Lord. I've been telling you how this is not right. He said, here's what I'm ready to do. I'm ready to sit down where I belong and let you teach me Amen. about yourself. Amen. His demanding here is not the same as his demanding in previous chapters. He's not demanding God to explain. He's demanding God to teach Job about God himself. He's saying, all right, Lord, I see it. I repent of all the things I've said and thought. I repent in dust and ashes. He said, I got a glimpse of you. I want to see more. I want to know more. I want to say to you tonight, God, the Lord, is your answer. Amen. And he's all the answer you need. Amen. Just, just, just crawl up close to him. Amen. And bow the knee before him. Amen. And say, all right, Lord, just show me yourself. You're enough. And you're all I need tonight.